Thank you, Jesus, for the message that you've given her. Tonight, I ask you to anoint her. Lord, that you would unlock your word to us, that you would give understanding. Maybe even those of us who've never heard or understood this book of Song of Solomon before, Lord, I ask you that it would be a fresh discovery for us, that we could understand your heart, your emotions, your desires, and the journey, um, the progression of holy passion that you have prepared for us and the zeal that you desire to bring us into um, intimacy with you. So we thank you, we trust you, we give you glory tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Okay, it's great to be with you tonight. Um, how many people have ever studied the Song of Songs, Song of Solomon? Okay, half. great. Um, I never had, when, when I moved to IHOP, I was, um, like Aaron said, I've been there for it's 2001, so 17 years, a little over, that I moved there. Um, and then, you know, if you know Mike Bickle and IHOP, we do the Song of Songs. That's just one of the things that we do. We study it, we get to know it, and I was like, whatever. Like, I, I, I opened it, started reading it, and I was like, I don't think this is going to work. Like, if you've looked at it, it's a very strange book. I mean, Psalms is very poetic and very flowy but song of solomon's like even a whole nother category of poetic and it's just weird it was like one of those books in the bible that you know we slipped verses to each other as jokes in high school at this private school i went to you know you slip you slip some of those song of solomon ones in there sometimes and like you're laughing in the middle and anyways just because there's some stuff in there but all that to say i did finally encounter jesus in it and so i'm just gonna Basically, this is an overview, which honestly is quite impossible to do in just the teaching. So I'm going to give you kind of some broad strokes and maybe just some of my favorite places or different pl places in the book that I've encountered the Lord to help my heart open up a little bit more. And then um, I want to encourage you, there's lots of online resources. Um, there's MikeBickle.org. There's another, IHOP Atlanta, we're trying to find the link. I know there's a great, the guy that leads IHOP Atlanta, Billy Humphrey, has an awesome Song of Songs teaching too. There's different ones out there that you can go and look at. So I just want to encourage you to do that. And also just to FYI, um, I've been in a Bible study for about t nine or ten years, this group of ladies, some come and go. And so for a season, we studied the Song of Songs, and our goal was to prove Mike Bickle wrong on any point. Not, not in a negative way. We just were like, we don't want to take it because he says it. Like, we want to know, is this really what this means? Because if you read Mike's notes often or whatever, somebody's notes, sometimes they just say this equals that, but you don't always get the in-between of how they got there. So we did all the in-between, we read all the commentaries, the Jewish commentaries, these commentaries, and we, he, he won. So we landed, Mike has a resource of all these, even like out of print Song of Solomon commentaries. So we got our hands on as much as we could, and we landed back at mostly we agree with those conclusions. So just an FYI, I'm not regurgitating, I am... I firmly believe, and some of it too, still to this day, some of it's still just a little bit of a mystery. I don't exactly know what that means, but that's part of the fun of the, of the scripture, I believe, that it always keeps us longing to encounter him more. So we're just going to jump in real quick. Song of Songs. You can call it Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. I like Song of Songs because it's the song of all songs is basically the point. There's no song that's ever going to trump this song, is like the point of the title. Anyway, so basically you can break up the song, the, the book, into two. I don't want this to get blown away. I'm not used to wind all the time. Every, I'm grateful. I'm not complaining. <laughs> Lord knows. Um, so basically you can divide the book up into two sections, chapters one through four, and chapters four through eight. Kind of, that's just kind of a clean break. The first four chapters are really about the bride encountering Jesus as she is his inheritance. She's learning to receive his love, his affection, get to know him in that way and learn, he really likes me. I am the object of his affection. 
chapters four through eight is her discovering the worth, his worth at a, a different level. She tastes the knowledge of God all throughout the book, but really in chapters four through eight, she really starts to grab a hold of the worth of this man, the beauty of who God is, and that it shifts. And we can, we'll look through different ways that you can see that shift. And obviously, there's different ways to approach this book. Um, you can view it as how I'm taking it, Christ and the Bride. That's just a simplistic way of saying it. It's really Israel and Jesus. That's really, that's the one of the ultimate things. It's a beautiful picture, but it also does apply to Christ and his bride. And then um, some people view it also as in the intimacy of a marriage between a man and a woman. I've never gone down that study route. So I just view it as Christ and the bride and Israel and the church. So I'm just going to use it as this is a book that directly talks about how God feels about me and how God feels about Israel. But I'm going to personalize it as me right now. I'm not replacing Israel. I don't believe in that. <laughs> Just an FYI. <laughs> I, yeah, you're welcome. We are grafted in and very grateful for that. So that's just an FYI of how. And also, just like we're sons of God, we are the bride of Christ. Just to clear that up. So it's definitely a feminine thing, but it's for male, female, doesn't matter. Just like I claim that I am a son of God. Same kind of a, same kind of concept. So open your heart to receive that. So anyways, the song starts with one of my favorite verses to pray still to this day is let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine. Now, yeah, I mean, it's such a good verse. I, well, first I want to start with, I was, uh, just a little bit of my story. I, when I first, maybe it was the second time I spoke publicly, I think I talked about this verse some, and then I also pulled in John 17, which I'll bring up in a minute. But um, I grew up in a uh, Christian family. I got saved when I was four. Both my husband and I got saved when our, we were four years old. So our little four-year-old, David, we're praying him in. Lord knows that little kid needs to get saved. So... <laughs> I mean, if you, he's an awesome boy, but wow, it would help him. So anyways, so we grew up in the Christian home. I fam- went to church. I went to private school, all this stuff. I was an insecure, shut down, shy little girl. Like I'm an, I am an introverted person by nature. I am fine being a stay-at-home mom for hours a day and all that. But I, as a high schooler and different stuff, I was just shut down. Like, I didn't like myself. I didn't have freedom in who I was or enjoy any of that kind of stuff. And so I remember doing even um, speech class, which, I mean, in a private school, my graduating class was three. So I always say I was in the top three of my class. So nobody, I don't have to tell them, there was only three people. And literally, I was the third. Like, I, I wasn't for, it is true, I was the top three, but I was the third. Like, the other two were way... They were actually, I think, younger than me and quite smarter than me, but I don't mind that. But I was very shut down and insecure, and I had to do a speech class. So when I'm saying I have to get up in front of my class, it's the three people, but it's also like um, uh, sophomore, is it freshman through sophomore, junior, senior. Those are how we do it in the U.S. Like, it was those four grades. So it's really only like 18 people I had to stand up. It's 18 people I've been like, you know, basically living with for years in school. But I'm still like hyperventilating, like terrified to stand up in front of people. My principal was like coaching me in the back of the classroom, like, breathe. Like, that. I'm just, so all that to say, public speaking was not my forte. So then it Fast forward, I've been at IHOP for a couple of years, maybe like a year and a half or so. It's 2003. We're getting ready for the One Thing Conference at the end of the year. And my job was to help Dwayne Roberts run it all and, um, and organize it all. And so I'm sitting there with Mike Bickle and he goes, so what are you going to speak on? And I was like, nothing. Like, I don't speak. He goes, no, you should do a breakout, which means not the main stage, praise God, but just like a side room, you know, where there's like... I'm thinking 100 people. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And I walk into the room. There's 500 people. 
I turn around and look at, like, I don't know, if it's my mom or dad or somebody. I was like, are they in the right room? Like, what are they all doing here? So I grabbed the microphone and I loved it. I like ate it up. Not in an arrogant, like, oh, listen to me. That's just not my personality. I, but I loved it. It was like I touched something and my dad goes, how did you do? How was it? I go, I love the microphone. Like, I really do. So all that to say, that's just a testimony of the Lord, of the Lord's faithfulness to get up. So I'm just saying, as a little picture of what this book can do. So one of the first times I spoke, um, the Lord had given me this picture because what we need to know that that's why this book is so important is often in our my journey with the Lord sometimes it feels like we're reaching and pulling and asking and asking and asking for so like just come and touch me T- come and let me feel your love and that's good we I'm not saying we don't need to reach ask pull all that stuff but we often, just because of our brokenness or our story or what happened to us in our past, we don't always believe the depth of his affection aimed down at us and he's longing to touch us. So I remember I was, I was praying this verse, I think, and the Lord gave me this picture of Jesus and he's sitting at the Father's right hand and he's look, like he was like a lion ready to pounce. He was seated, seating, I mean, it says right now he's seated. I'm longing for the day where he stands up. It'll be terrifying, but it says he's seated. So he's sitting there, and he was like aching to get off of this throne, like about ready to pants, pounce. And the, he's looking at his father, and he's praying, Father, I desire. Father, I desire. And he keeps praying, and the father going, he, the, it, it, the father was looking at him going, she hasn't asked yet. She hasn't asked yet. And really what he was saying is he's waiting for the bride to say, let him kiss me. Let him kiss me. Now, when we think of kiss, I think you know this, but we're not talking literal kiss. We're talking the kisses of his word touching my heart. We have all touched that. You know, when the Bible or the Lord speaking, it pierces your heart like that there's nothing like that when that happens to our heart and it's so tenderizing. So in this picture, I am, the throne is basically that big white door down there and I'm hiding behind a pillar, peeking. This is not an open vision, just so you know, this is like a dim impression in my mind's eye. I'm just telling you to encourage you because some people get like bright vision, see things. I am like, not, I'm not dull, but the way the Lord speaks to me is seemingly dull, if that makes sense. Like, it's not bright, it's not vivid. It's small little impressions and small little whispers. That's just, and if I, I feel like if I blink, I miss it sometimes. I don't know why, but that's how he works with me. And then I have one of my best friends, dreams, living color, literal encounter dreams almost every night. So, it just, everybody's a little different with how the Lord speaks to him, and it's okay. But anyways, in this... Picture, I'm standing behind a pillar, also going, like, is it okay to come? Like, can I actually come? Because we have this thing in our hearts where, I don't know if this is how I feel sometimes, where I'm like, I just need to feel your love. I just need to feel your love. But I'm also going, but don't get too close. Like, but a little too close is a little too vulnerable. So that there's that lack of confidence in us when we do approach the throne. In church, in certain contexts, we feel bold and feel confident. But when it's just me and him in a room, man, it's uncomfortable. And that was just part of that encounter was realizing it's not about me. I mean, it is. But mostly it's about that man on the throne and that burning affection he has in his heart. And he's had it for all the years When he ascended in flesh and blood, he's still that man up there. There's a real man. That's one of my favorite things. There is a real man, and I get to hug him someday. And my arms aren't going to go through him. I'm going to, like, actually touch him. He's longing and aching. So when we pray, let him kiss me with the kisses of his word and touch my heart, he's not sitting up there with his legs crossed kind of going, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to touch you. He's going, thank you. I've been waiting to touch you. Sometimes it has to get through all of the 
filters of our brokenness and the bombardment of the enemy. But let it be known, it's not because of his lack of affection. Sometimes it's our lack of receptivity. It's a, the fact that we think we're standing under the sun, but we're really hiding under shade trees of comfort that we're so used to because it's scary. I mean, it is, love is vulnerable. Like, I'm married, so I can say that. Like, falling in love is the most vulnerable thing that's ever happened to me. And it's the same with our relationship with the Lord. Like, we like him in certain places, but getting into that deep place of our hearts, it's like, uh, I don't know about that. That's like just a little bit too close. But that's honestly, that is the goal of everything he does. We are that prized possession that he's going after. He doesn't want, he has servants, he has angels. They serve him, they love him, they honor him, they worship him. He has that. He wants partners. He wants friends. He wants that intimacy and relationship. Just like in my marriage, I don't want to just be the person who like does dishes and takes care of the boys. Like we have a partnership. We run together and it's so much fun. That's what the Lord's looking for. And that's really the point of this, this song is that there's this bride that she's in different translations at different books She's called the Shulamite. And basically, too, you um, don't always believe the headers. Well, on any book of the Bible, FYI. But specific, like when I'm talking about this book, don't always believe the headers. Like do a little research for yourself. And I have friends we disagree on different ones. So that's fine. You can totally disagree. It doesn't matter. But do a little research yourself and figure out who you think speaking at different times. Because I know in different translations, they'll flip it. Because in the Hebrew, it's sometimes like, that could be a he or a she, it's both, it's kind of a gender neutral you, and so do a little research so that you know who's talking, because it really can change different parts of the storyline. That's okay. Believe me, I will lose my train of thought, and I might have to ask somebody where I was, so I'm fine with interruptions. I have three kids. I might get interrupted doing this, so it's just my life. So basically, that's just kind of the point of the book, the overview is like how you break it down. And also just to, I think, honestly, one of the most important things in our life is, is now, I mean, I'm not old, I know that, but I feel older than I was when I moved to IHOP, I was 19. So now I'm 37. So I'm like, okay, I have a little bit of history. And the ability to receive love, I think, is one of the strongest or most evidence fruits of maturity in a believer that I've ever that I've seen somebody's ability to receive love from the Lord no matter what the circumstance that's why David is unbelievable David's ability king David David's ability to sin i mean i'm talking some big sins that if they happened in the church today it would be and then they do often but David's ability to turn on a dime, repent, that's key, repent, and then say, but you delivered me because you delighted me. I'm like, see, I, I don't do that. I have a penalty box. I have a, like a timeout. I have a get it together, Jess. David didn't do any of that. He just went straight in face to face, took away the veil, I mean, good night, with boldness and just said, I know you like me. That is the point of learning to, this book is learning to receive that love. It is so hard. So I'll start with even just the story of how dating my husband. So Aaron and I fell in love in um, 2011. Let me get, get this right. So I didn't get married until I was uh, 30, almost 31. So we fell in love in 2011, and we'd go on these dates, obviously, because we were dating, you know, falling in love, and we'd sit across the table from each other, and he would just get this look, and I'd get a little nervous. I'd be like, oh, no, the food's not here yet. I have nothing. And he'd just get this look where he just wants to look at me, and he doesn't want to talk. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, nothing. He still does it to this day. I'm a little bit, I'm, I can handle it better now. 
I'm like, okay, can we talk? Or like, at least could there be bread on the table or something for me to like, because it's unnerving. Have you had somebody look, just stare at you in the eyes with deep affection and you try not to look away? It is really hard to do. But over time, I slowly grew in confidence that, okay, it's okay, I can let him just look at me. And honestly, I, I mean, I say that, it's cute, but it really is the story of the Song of Solomon. You can um, look through the book, and there's several times where for, it talks about him looking at her, or she says, don't look at me, or she says, turn away. It's a story of letting him just gaze upon her, and her learning to actually receive that love. And you can look at it different ways. So my way of breaking down the Song of Solomon is totally different than Mike Bickle's in a way, but that's fine because this is the way I encountered it. Because it, she starts off asking for the kisses, and then it moves on later to where I'm going to skip all over so you can try and keep track in your Bible, or like I'm mostly doing this to provoke you to go read it later and study it later. Um, she cries out, like, tell me, oh, you whom I love, where do you feed your flocks? She, like, wants to go, but she's a little nervous. So she's asking, like, I want to run with those people. I want to know what you know. But she says, before that, she says, I'm dark but lovely. And then he, she also says, um, sorry, I know I'm jumping around. The wind moved my... Um, In verse 6, she says, first in verse 5, she says, I'm dark but lovely, because actually Sharon's going to talk about that tomorrow night a little bit and break it down, so I'm not going to steal her thunder. I'll just leave that one there. But then she says, one of the first things she says is, do not stare at me. She says, don't look at me. Because of my weakness, because I've done it wrong, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. She just feels that shame. And she says, don't look at me. I mean, I think we do that all the time with the Lord. We're walking along and we're like, we feel confident in this, but don't look at me in this part or whatever. And honestly, he just wants to gaze. That, my husband, I remember one time where we were, uh, there was something silly that happened. I think I got like thrown off by another girl. I mean, I know this sounds petty stuff, but I, it really does apply to how we work in our relationship with the Lord it's because it's about the opening up the heart. So I'm like fighting, telling him this cheesy thing in my heart because I feel like I'm 16 instead of 30. You know, I'm like, oh God, I'm 30 years old. I should really be over this. And my husband, uh, Aaron, I think, I don't remember if we were engaged or dating. He goes, I don't actually care what you're going to say. I just care that you talk to me. I care that you open up and tell me what you're thinking. That's what I'm after, Jess. I don't care what you're going to say. Like, and I was like, oh, you're right. Because in my culture, my Western Christianity, we're good at saying all the right things. Really good at it. I mean, to a fault, religiously, really good at knowing what to say, when to say it, quote what Bible verse, especially because I've been in the church since I was four. I know the Bible. I know what, how I'm supposed to think. I know, but I also know that's not always what's going on on the inside. And women, we're good at like hiding that and doing a little dance and putting a smile on. And I'm not good at that anymore. I just kind of gave up because it's not worth it. And you get married, your husband can read you like an open book anyways. So I just remember thinking, oh, that's what you're after. You're just after the opening of our heart is what he's after. And the first four chapters of this book, that's what he's doing with her. He's wooing her and trying to tell her, it's okay, you can trust me. We think when we get saved, we'd immediately trust him, but we don't. We don't trust him. I mean, you can see it sometimes in how people parent their kids, to how they view their finances, all that stuff. It's, it always exposes these areas of, are you as good as you say you are. And he really, honestly, he really is the kindest person you'll ever meet. But it does take that opening up of the heart. I mean, Psalm 139, he knows it all anyways. 
And we say that, like, oh, you know all things. He's like, yeah, but I kind of would like it if you would tell me the all things that I already know, that you know I know, but I would like it if you opened and told me. I remember one time I had just finished this, not to sound whole, I mean, I'd finished this 21-day fast, and it's not like it was glorious, so don't picture, wow, she's amazing, whatever. It was one of those weak whatever, but I was obedient. It still it counted. So I had a few things the Lord had spoken to me in this 21-day fast. And obviously, I mean, like lots of people, I had an application in mind, which that's often where we get, not off, but like we just don't always know what the application is. And it's a little hard to apply things the Lord has told us. So I had this application in mind, and I remember thinking, okay, that's not what I thought. So then my heart is really hurt and I'm disappointed and a little discouraged because it was different than I thought. And I remember thinking, okay, I know all the things I should say and feel and it's okay. Like, you know, he's still faithful, whatever. But my heart was like shutting down. Like it wasn't opening. I would, I was feeling like, but I'm still hurt and frustrated. So instead I went into my room, laid on my bed and I just told him, I'm like, I don't, like this. I think you messed up. Like, and I wasn't mean. I wasn't harsh to the Lord. I just said, you know what? I'm discouraged. I'm disappointed. I thought you said this, but it, this. So I just kind of poured out my heart like David did in the Psalms. I said, but I trust you. And then I, in my mind's eye, again, I just saw his face get really close. And all he said is, is there anything else? And I just wept. All he wanted was me just to talk. That's all he wanted was me to trust him. And that, again, is what this story is, again, about. So she starts off by saying, don't stare at me. And we often, man, I feel that still to this day. There's areas and layers of this where the enemy comes in, and I agree with him. And then when the Lord starts to shine his face, I'm like, Please don't, because I feel so messed up right now. So it goes on this journey of, I, like I said, I wish I, this is the hardest thing to do, is to give an overview of this book. It is so packed, full of all these nuggets. But basically, she is sitting at the king's banqueting table. She's tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. That's what the first chapter is about. She's whining, he's whining and dining her. It's kind of like, I call it sometimes, if you've been at, well, for those who've been at IHOP for a while or people that had visited or moved there for a little bit, it's like the honeymoon season. It's really sweet, and you're just encountering God and learning all these new things, and it's wonderful. So that's partly that first part, just tasting that the Lord is good. And then the, one of my favorite verses, too, is Ch- Song of Solomon 2, 3 through 5. This is a great place to... We have often sung this in the prayer room. It's one of my favorites. It says, I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to his banqueting table, and his banner over me was love. Um, And then it's also the verse before that. It says, he's like an apple tree among among the trees of the forest. And the reason that's significant, too, like I'll just give you this one, and this is how the book kind of breaks down sometimes. Like an apple tree among the trees of forest, that's actually kind of odd. Do you ever see an apple tree amongst a big bunch of big cedars or pine trees? No, you don't. I mean, you see an apple orchard over here, and then later, wherever, you see the big, huge forest. So the picture is, I mean, a huge tree brings how much shade? Just like a sliver, but an apple tree brings how much shade? a ton of shade because it's this fat, round, like it's a bigger style tree, at least the ones I grew up with in my yard. I don't know about in Israel, so I should probably research that. Anyways, so the picture too is that the trees of the forest are high and lofty, but he's an apple tree, which is super accessible and very easy to come underneath and feel like I'm actually close to this. And the, the, the tree is speaking about his humanity. Wood in the Bible often speaks about flesh, humanity. So this is, that is what that is a picture. It's like she's in this part of the storyline. She's just sitting down and resting and feeding on 
the beauty of Jesus. That's what you can just say. Feeding on the work of the cross, meditating on the cross, receiving the benefits of the cross. This is a really comfortable place in her journey. We've all, I hope, had seasons of this where it's like, I like this season where it's just me and Jesus. I mean, obviously corporately. And then that's where you're receiving his love. Then it gets a little tricky. He switches things up on her. All of a sudden, you see him coming, and it says that he's leaping and skipping like a gazelle. Like, have you seen a gazelle? I mean, they are like the bounciest little things. Like, you know, they just, and you'd think that they weigh nothing because they're just free as could be to bounce off on crazy things that you couldn't imagine jumping. So she sees him. And she's at this point resting, and he comes leaping, and he says to her, rise up, my love, and come away. Let me see your face, and let me hear your voice. Again, he's saying, just let me look at you. Now, really, because if we look at him, there's, we will see him, and then we'll be, grow in love. There's this principle we call the beholding and becoming principle. You you become what you behold. The more you behold him, the more you will believe him and become like him. And that's what his goal is, like, just look up. I mean, how often, and we're all the same. I look through all my day, my, out my day, and I'm like, no wonder my heart is like sinking. I haven't been looking up and lifting my eyes. And I can see it in the prayer room too. I'm not psychoanalyzing, I'm just observing, but it's part of my personality. Like when I go into the prayer room at IHOP, I can see the people who have that confidence and love by the way that they pray, the way that they're postured. I'm not saying hunched over is, is bad. I'm often like, whatever. But there is a certain posture you can see of people when they know and they have that, I am confident in his love. They often lift their face. They often look more at rest and peaceful. And well, I'm not dissing the Koreans. I love the Koreans. But sometimes there's that militant thing. And that's, there's a time, I am all for war, spiritual warfare. There is a time and a place for that. But sometimes confident in love is way more powerful than spiritual warfare because she, you know who you are. Graham Cook. Um, if I use people's names like Graham Cook and everything, it doesn't always mean I'm endorsing everything that they teach, just an FYI. I have a lot of preachers I listen to, and I don't always agree with everything, so it's just a heads up. He had this vision one time where in the vision or dream, he wakes up and he sees these huge, huge demons, like this battle, he's on a battlefield, and they are massive, and he's trembling, and they are... He has fear, and so then they are feeding off of his fear and getting, like, bigger. And then he looks up. He hears the Lord saying, Greg, because the Lord calls him Greg. Like, look up, look up. So he looks up, and there's Jesus, this little Jesus, standing up on top of the demons going, look up here. Look up here. I'm up here. Like, it's okay. And as he looked at him, the demons got smaller and smaller and smaller because it's about what we're gazing on. It's about what we're looking at. Yeah, there's demons. Like people always say, Mike Pickle, you believe there's a demon behind every bush? He goes, no, I don't. I think that there's 10. (laughs) He goes, there's the law. He's not, but he's not like, he's more like, but I look at him. And then he tells you sometimes there's times to pray certain things and you pray those things because they're real. And we've taught our kids, like, is Satan powerful? And David goes, yes. I go, is he stronger than you? And David goes, no. I'm like, we're working on that one, David. I go, but who's the strongest? And he always says, Jesus. I'm like, right, but you need to know there is a darkness that's strong. But the point of this book is that he is so strong. But we know that in the corporate body. We know that in the songs. We know that, whatever. But do you know it in your little heart for just you? Not for another person. I know a lot of pastors that know it for their flock. And I've heard them say they don't know it for their own heart. They believe it for the people that they've seen touch it. But in their own heart, it's so hard for them to believe that they are his favorite one. But that's really what he wants. I think, to me, some of the most impacting people in my life are not the most anointed, most skilled, or charismatic, it's the people that I've seen that are so confident in love 
amidst whatever happens. I have a friend who has a bone degenerative disease. There's no cure. Her body literally just has no um, cartilage between the b joint and the ball and socket. It's just bone against bone, most of her whole body. She's been in multiple body casts since she was a kid. Hip surgeries, she's 41, 42 years old. I want to be like her so bad. I want to touch what she's touched in that man. Now, I don't really want to live what she's lived, but she's unoffended, she's free, she's happy, she's in so much pain. And she, but she, and she knows who she is, and I go, that to me is way more terrifying than that preacher up there on that stage. I mean, yes, I love the preachers, but do you know what I'm trying to say? Confident in love is terrifying. It's actually nerve-wracking. People don't know what to do with people that are so confident in love that they're not shaken. I mean, it's back to the book of Acts. It's back to the Fox's book of martyrs who they knew where their inheritance was in. They weren't shaken. That is, the, this book's not just fluff. It is like this is what's going to keep us. I do believe that the, the church is going to have her greatest hour coming and the darkest hour coming. It is going to be so hard. But what's going to keep us is his love and his affection. And it's based on, not him, my ability to receive and to open. Now, it has a, like a catch-22. He's the only one that can actually open my heart, too, at the same time. I have to say yes. But at the same time, he's the one to do it. But it's this beautiful partnership. But that's partly what this is. So he comes leaping on the mountains and he's saying, okay, you've sat down for a while, you've eaten, you've tasted, you've seen that I'm so beautiful, now come away with me and leap on these mountains. And what do you think she says? She says, no. She goes, turn my beloved and you go and you do it, but I'm too comfortable. And in that part too, it also says he's gazing through the lattice. Like he's gazing through into this window, like as much as he can to see her. And, but she says no. And this is, I think, hard, but also some people this is hard for, others it's not. And so she turns, tells him to leave, and then he disciplines her. Because if you've read Hebrews, he does discipline the ones he loves. And he chastises. So in this storyline, he just lifts that sweetness. He's still there. But that sweetness of his presence is shifted. And we've all had times where it's like things are going really good. And I honestly, in this book, I don't, I think I actually knew the times I turned him away, if that makes sense. Like, I don't think we actually know we're saying no sometimes. It's, late, it's hindsight. It's like, oh, I turned you away. And then there's a shift and it causes another level of hunger in our hearts to cry out for more of him because we need more revelation of him. That's the only thing that's going to sustain us is a revelation of the knowledge of God. We have to know this man, not just because whatever, it's Christianity. It's like, because he's my life. Like Deuteronomy says, I cling to him because he's my life. I have nothing outside of this man. And he knows that. We don't know that yet. So he is, honestly, when you view this, I think in our brokenness, we don't often like that discipline thing because we have wrong father figures or mother figures or brokenness, but it's the most loving thing he could do because he's going, I want you closer to me. And if I step back, I'm still, he's still fully there, but if I step back so the sweetness shifts, you're going to step forward because you're going to want me again. And that's what she did. She wants that. And he knows, too. This is very important in our Western culture. I just know how we are in the U.S. We love comfort. I mean, love it. But I guess everybody knows that about the U.S. We have our air conditioning. We have our ice. We have every imaginable restaurant and store, everything. I mean, I have Amazon Prime. I can have it in a minute at my house or, you know, the next day or sometimes the same day. Like, it's just instant comfort. What you want, it's just there. Obviously, you don't have as much 
here in Barbados. I get that now that I'm here, but I like it. I would like AC though, just to be honest, but I'm American, I'm fine with that. Um, but he also knows that, I think that he knows our ache for comfort, but his highest goal is not making us feel good. That's not the Lord's highest goal. His highest goal is partnering with us, which will make us feel good. Like he knows what's going to cause our hearts to soar. But our comfort, sometimes I think because we're very narcissistic without knowing it, our comfort is primary. But it, it's not his primary. He really, he's really good at making us uncomfortable. Very good at making us uncomfortable. But because there's so many mixed messages this day for coming from the church, I think, it's hard to tell because people are like, oh, no, that's the Lord. He just wants you to be happy. And I'm like, well, yeah, he wants you to be happy in him. Like he knows, like you have to trust he knows what's going to make you happy. Praise God I didn't marry the guy I dated in 2003. That would not have made me happy. The guy I married in 2012 was the right decision. So the Lord really knows. So part of this journey is us prying our fingers off of what we think should be, how it should be, and just learning to trust him. I really, honestly, it sounds so simple. After being in ministry for the 17 years, it is the hardest thing. I have seen people come and go and different leaders stay, but the, and I can, they're offended, different things I'm, I'm going. It really does boil down to that place of intimacy in your heart between you and him, and if you receive his love and if you trust him. It really, that is the power of it. And I've seen missionaries come and go and burn out because they're doing it of their own affection and we're gonna like grow weary that's why even in the house of prayer this isn't like a peripheral message if you want to build prayer rooms if you want to do you have to have his delight and his affection there's a reason in isaiah 62 i've set watchmen on my wall but what's the verse before hepzibah Beulah, I call you my beloved. You're not forsaken. He feeds her on who she is as his bride before he sets her as watchman. And a lot of us are called to be watchmen in different ways. I'm called to be an intercessor, but I'm a mom with three boys. So my intercession looks like help Jesus. That's about it, but it works. Sometimes it's a little bit more mixed in if I get away from my sweet little Ezra or whatever. But it counts, but it's, it's based on that, af that affection. This affection, his delight in us breaks every religious spirit, every thing of legalism, of performance. I am from a, I mean, I think most people are performance-based kind of style family. Like, that's just how it, you know, it works. And I, I am a people pleaser by, like, in my personality, I can have that bent, and it, like it's my strength to serve people, but it can be my greatest weakness, if you understand. And because of abuse in my childhood, I literally believed I existed for somebody's pleasure. The Lord asked me one day, why do you exist? And I said, for people. And I, I didn't even, it's like one of those times you don't even, the words come out and you wish you could pull them back in because it was like, that's not the right answer, but it's what I believed, and that's what he was after. He goes, you don't exist for people, Jess. You exist for me. That's it. And yes, he wants me to touch people, bless people, love on people, but not from the identity of I am here to serve people. That's not my identity. My identity is I'm his. And then I get to go tell others. And when you have that, it is so refreshing. You can pour yourself out all day long because you're not trying to get it from other people because you're getting it from him. And yes, I get affection from my husband, but that's not the, he, my husband, I mean, now that I'm married, it's kind of annoying to, not annoying to be married, sorry. I love being married. But, but you realize how much you love somebody, but you can't get into their heart. I cannot touch those places in my husband's heart that he needs to be touched by the love of God, and he can't touch mine. It, that's the frustration. I'm like, I wish I could hug your inner man. I wish I could hug your heart where you need it. I can't, but the Holy Spirit can. That's the kisses 
of his word. And that is the, the most vulnerable thing for us. We hate it. Women hate it. We're a little better at it, but men really hate it. Some men are better. I just know from talking like to my husband, watching my dad, different ones, it's just vulnerable. But I, I just want to say it's worth every awkward moment of being vulnerable to have that love come in and touch those places. I'll never be the same person ever because I've let those little kisses of his word and his affection touch those. So after she turns him away, he does withdraw a little bit, but he still just feeds her on the knowledge of him. This is what the Lord does. When we don't do what's right, he still just keeps feeding us on who he is and his affection. And he feeds her on this, the knowledge that he's a safe savior, which again is just, she's learning to trust. And then um, I love this. This is, if you want to just sit and do something very vulnerable, just open up to chapter four and it's where he just starts describing her. And she, had, at this point, you have to realize she didn't even say yes yet. She still said no, and she's still in her little comfort. And so he comes to her, and he says, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. And he just starts describing her. She hasn't said yes yet. This goes against our, like, do it right, and then the reward comes. It goes against all that. He's motivating her with his affections and feeding her on the knowledge of who he is and how he feels. And that God doesn't define us by our struggle. And her turning her way was not rebellion. It was just immaturity. Often I think that gets a little mixed up. It's not like you can see young believers in their 20s. They do some funny stuff. I was one of them. They'll be fine. Just keep encouraging them. They're going to do some funny, quirky stuff. Just keep on them about the beauty of God, how he feels about them, and they'll come around. That's the same thing the Lord does with us. He doesn't define us by our struggles. He doesn't label and say, well, that's your struggle. He says, no, you're my bride. You're my son. You're my daughter. I'm going to keep telling you you're beautiful until you believe it. Yes, he sees, like Sharon will talk about, he sees the darkness way better than we do. Like the thing is, we're always like, we're so dark. He's like, actually, you're a little bit darker. Like, I see it all. There is that. He's like, but you're way more beautiful than you can ever imagine. We are that queen, that king, that partner in his heart. And over time, like I said, I had that picture of the throne room. Over time, I don't even know what time it is, speaking of time. Over time, that picture has shifted to where now I can stand shoulder to shoulder with Jesus on that throne and look down with him and say, now what are we going to do? I'm not hiding behind that pillar. I do have seasons. We all do. I'm not saying I've, got, I've arrived, but there's seasons where you're like, uh, and I have to work that muscle of believing. And so I sit down with these things and I say, I am fair. I'm beautiful to you. I stumbled. I have, there's different things. We all have weaknesses or whatever, but that's not what defines us. It's standing up in confidence saying, you like me. You love me, and I'm going to believe your word, and I'm going to believe these descriptions of what he says about her. I mean, he describes her teeth, her temples, her neck, everything. Your eyes are like doves. Doves' eyes just mean like uh, set apart, like doves only mate. No, I don't want to say that wrong. I'm just not going to say that. You can research it later because I can't remember. But all that to say, it's just single devotion. Doves have eyes of single devotion. I think it's because their eyes face just forward instead of the sides of their heads. Most birds have, but doves just look forward. I think that's the way it is. Anyways, so he goes on to describe her, and that's how it motivates her. So let me just figure out where I want to go next. So then after he describes who she is, he tells her that she's altogether lovely. And he asks her again, come away with me. And then she does. But here's, um, let me just get this. 
Oh, yeah, sorry. She says, chapter 4, verse 6, she says, Until the cool of the day, when the shadows feel, flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh in the hill of frankincense. So she's saying, I will go with you. And just a little insight. Um, she's saying, until the shadows flee, she's going, even though the circumstances haven't changed and I still have some of those fears and some of those different things, I'm still going to arise. Because oftentimes in our journey, It's like, well, let me just get this all fixed, and then I'll go. And the Lord's like, no, how about you just walk, and all that stuff will get figured out as you walk. That's the point of this progression is she wants, like, we all have those, I feel safe, and I feel comfortable in this area. And then he comes and says, arise. We say no. He tells us how great we are or encourages our hearts. And so we decide, okay, you know what? I'm going to do it even though I'm still afraid. We're not. Like, you can't just get over it on your, by yourself. You just have to journey with the Lord sometimes and do the walk of faith and believe that he is who he says he is. It's just hard. I'm like, being a Christian is not easy. I don't know who said it was. I don't, some people do. It's not easy. But it's the best thing. I'm like, it is the most amazing thing. I'm a happy person because he likes me. And also, just a FYI, like, being God's favorite. It, that part is really important too because it breaks comparison. And that's something huge we need broken off of even a social media generation and all the different things. Just like with, I think it hits me in a more clear way now that I have three kids because they're all my favorite. And that's really true. But it's, a, it's not just a statement. When I look at David or Jariah and Ezra, they all touch my heart in a very, very unique way. Jariah, like his name is Jariah Cayman Arrow. Cayman is Hawaiian, means from the heart. And that, that kid, even Aaron too, he can pierce us to the point we're about to cry often. He has this uncanny ability to look at us in the eyes and say something, and we're like, oh my gosh, we love you. David, on the other hand, has this joy and this energy about life. If you've seen him, he's like bouncing everywhere. He's just happy. He just makes us happy all the time. There's, I mean, not, there's times I'm not happy, but that's his gift to us. Now, Jariah doesn't touch that same place in me. It's the same with us and the Lord. Like we think, well, how can you be the, his favorite and me? Because we're so different. And one of my favorite pictures of that too is like um, scientists, I, you could f- try to find this online somewhere, but I don't remember who. Scientists have figured out that our body, our DNA can be broken down into a song. So most people have musical notes, like your DNA is musical notes, which is just crazy. Like creation really is groaning and singing. You're singing all the time and you just don't know it. And th- so the way the Lord hears you Everybody has a different song, and it touches him completely different. And those songs enter his being so different. So when you are confident and stand and believe in who you are, can you imagine what that song sounds like coming from your being? When there's no darkness and those lies. I mean, there's always lies. I still have. I call them the residue. It doesn't always mean that I believe them, but there's always these residue. They're not... In my face, accusing accusations I can deal with. It's the residue ones that are hard, if that makes sense. Those little ones that lurk over here and they whisper all day long just waiting for you to like snatch that thought and take it in. Anyways, so I'll let to say that. But so then what happens is she goes after him and she says, yes, I will go my way. And there's lots more dialogue and different descriptions and everything you can, again, I would really do encourage you to read this on your own. I used to just read the life of David, and then I would read as much of this as I could, and then I'd go back to the life of David, because at least the life of David had, like, you could understand it. (laughs) But study this. There's really good commentaries out there. And again, I do recommend Mike's, because I agree, I like it. Um, So... There's different things here he asks her to do, and, and then she, no, let me say this right. There's one part. 
sorry, I don't underline in my Bible a lot, and this one is a newer one, so it's hard for me to sometimes find. And I'm not a chapter and verse person, unashamedly. I'm just not. Like, they don't, my husband knows every chapter, verse for the ones. Any, okay, sorry. So then in verse, chapter 4, verse 9, she, after she says, you know, I'm going to go my way. I, I mean, I'm gonna, yeah, up the mountain of myrrh until the shadows flee away. In verse 9, he says, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride, with one glance of your eyes. One glance? Ravished is a very intense word. It's like, if you look it up, it is like, holy, it is very intense. It kind of seems dis- very, you're like, little disproportionate, God. Like, I glanced and said, okay, I think I trust you, I'm going to go. And his heart, like, does this tornado type explosion of love and moves. That's really who he is. He is not a passive God. That's just how we've grown up. That's Greek thinking. It's not biblical thinking. It's not Hebrew. Like, it's just not the, how the Bible goes. He's not a passive God. He's very active, very involved, cares a lot. Anger and passion. So she says yes with one little glance. Like, it's like when my little boys go, okay. But I can tell they really still want to not do it. But they go, okay, mommy, I'll trust you. I am like, I'll take that. I'll take that little glance. And I'm filled with pleasure over them. Not to the extent that the Lord is. But it's, it's, it's in this moment that you see she's growing in confidence to be able to look back at him and say, okay, I trust you. And so then she says, and then he praises her and tells her some more things. And then she says, awake, O north winds, and blow, O south winds. And she's just saying, come what may. Like, test me. I want to prove that I belong to you. I love that. We've all had those moments, I mean, maybe, those times in our life where we're like, and sometimes I think, I, I did it like in youthful zeal, but the Lord, he really takes you up on those youthful, like, anything you want, just whatever might happen, I'll do it. And he's like, okay. But he's very kind. But that's really what she's praying, a little bit more mature than what I just say. But she's saying, and when we view, read this too, awake, O north winds, and come, O south. The north winds are usually adversity. Obviously, when it's north, it's cold. We would like that at the moment here, but the south winds are usually refreshing. They're enjoyable, but, and it's been taught both ways, but honestly, refreshing and like blessing is just as much as a testing as adversity. When the Lord heaps blessing sometimes, it is, it is a test on our souls too. It's a test on, okay, what am I in this for? And he loves, like the Lord really does delight to give us simple things. That's fine. I know he, he is the God. He's a good father who loves to give us good gifts. And he does material things. I'm not against that. I'm just saying, she's saying, just test my heart. I want, I want it to be proven that I'm in it for you alone. And I think that's what we want. Like, even as a spouse to my husband, I want our marriage tested. I want it proven. I will choose him no matter what comes. I choose that man. Even if I don't feel it, whatever, I will choose that man. And that's really what she's saying. Like, I want to know that I am yours. I belong to you. And there's a progression in the Song of Solomon, which you can look at sometime where um, you can see that her, she's starting to shift. First, she says um, in chapter 2, verse 16, she says, I am my beloved. Stands, if you've ever seen them, they're like the biggest music stand you've ever seen in your life. She says, my, my beloved is mine and I am his. So she first identifies as he's mine. Like that's it. And then it changes throughout the book where she switches to saying, I am his. And she's growing in confidence that she belongs to him. She is his possession. And, but it's not a soldier. It's not a servant. It's a bride, and it's not a bride in how the Western church views marriage and husband and wife. It is a bride 
in a partnership, co-heirs type of thing. And yes, I do. I mean, women, we are the weaker, weaker vessel. I'm fine with that. But that doesn't mean I'm less than in any way, shape, or form. It's just the way. And the, my husband absolutely is the head. So I'm not disagreeing with that. But there's this partnership that he's aching for and longing for. And you can see where she starts to switch. And honestly, he's fine with the progression. I think sometimes we're harder on ourselves. And this, even uh, some of the young ones or the 20-year-olds were like, come on, it's not all about you. But like, let them just get there, okay? As long as you keep feeding them. And one of my favorite preachers is... Um, John Piper, I don't know if any of you ever listen to John Piper. I love John Piper. Like, again, I said, I don't agree with everything, but I love that man will preach the glory of God unlike any other, and he will not back down on it. But he's more, we laugh, he's more the second half of Song of Solomon. He's always talking about how we belong to God and how what we can do with God, for God. And sometimes we're like, Piper just, we, you need to always remember too that he, there's that season where the Lord just pours into you and pours into the knowledge of God. So you need both. And honestly, this book is not like a linear progression. It's a cyclical progression, meaning there's seasons where I'm like, I'm back at the shade tree and I just need to sit and rest. Or I'm back at, well, I'm always at let him kiss me with the kisses of his word. So that's the thing. Babe, what time am I supposed to stop? Because you know me. All right, look, almost there. That's the problem is you give me the microphone and I don't put it down for a while. Okay, so then she says, awake, O north winds. And then what happens is there's been this fruit that's been growing in her heart and people are starting to see it. And there, there's the, I didn't really mention him, but there, in the book there's characters, there's the watchmen. They're like the church, different people, and sometimes they're not usually the good parts of the church. They, they, they're, they're the ones she gets hurt by, but um, it'll come up in a minute. So basically, she, he, she says, come and eat of the fruit of my life. Awake, O north, wind, south. Come and eat of the fruit that's been growing in these past seasons of me feeding on the knowledge of God. And so he comes and it says, I'll come into my garden, my sister, my bride. And we can, I'm going to talk about Jesus and his humanity and divinity on Thursday. But I think it's significant, too, that he says, my sister, my bride. There's something about being Jesus' uh, like sibling that's very important, even in intimacy, for our hearts to know that he is our brother in humanity. Um, anyway, so he says that, and he comes, and he he says, I've taken my myrrh, I've eaten of the honeycomb, my honey, all of it. Now, what's interesting about this season, which I think I've felt this before too, is she's super fruitful. You can imagine, it's like she's thriving in ministry too. People, I think on the outside, people can see, wow, that person's changed, there's fruit in their life. And then Jesus comes and he drinks of it. And then there's a shift to where it almost looks like she did at the beginning where she was barren. Now she's stripped. Does that make sense? But it's not because of immaturity. It's because of maturity. But people on the outside can't see it. So she's not seen correctly, if that makes sense. She's misjudged. And the Lord allows all this because he's going, I'm going to show you what's going to happen if you misjudge her and you take her ministry because you think, oh, she's not fruitful anymore. But really what happened is, he partook of the fruit. It was him. It wasn't her and her immaturity doing something wrong or just weak. It was him partaking of that fruit. And so then she's left, and it feels like how many people know? You've, it feels the same. You, the enemy wants to come and say, see, you're just immature. You don't know what you're doing, if this makes sense. And if this doesn't make sense, just go study it and then think about what I said another time when you're later. It's fine. So... It's important to me because I love to validate where people are in their journey and their emotions, and it's real. We all have these seasons. It's hard. And so this is a very critical season. So in this part of the book, in chapter 5, it's the infamous chapter 5, if you've ever studied it. So she goes and searches for him. She gets her ministry taken away. She can't 
feel he comes to her she goes after him all this stuff happens basically she's searching for him and she can't find him and then the daughters of jerusalem they're kind of like the little sisters who like to watch and they're like okay what's going on is this good like who is it like what is she doing you know it's just maybe the people you're mentoring so they come up to her and they go who is your beloved that you would do, like, why, more, some translations say more than another. My, my says, what kind of beloved is your beloved? Like, who is your God that though your ministry got taken, like, think of this in U.S. terms. Take away the floweriness. There's this thriving preacher, minister, who doesn't do anything wrong, but gets his whole ministry taken. They say, you're not fruitful anymore. You're not anointed. They take his whole stage. Everybody has blogs about him. Everything's going down. In his heart of hearts, that's not what happened, and that's not who he is. And, but there's still this other group, and they're going, why are you still unoffended? And her response is, all that fruit that he partook of just pours out at the knowledge of God, and she goes, oh, my beloved, he's chief among 10,000. If you'd seen him, what does the stage matter? What does a ministry matter if you've seen him and touched him? And she goes on to describe Jesus, and it's like, oh, I want that. I want that to where he is that substance in my being that if you push me, I'm not going to bleed my own self. Like, oh, I deserve this. Oh, I deserve that. She didn't say any of that. She said, where did he go? I want him. Have you seen him? And she's humble. She tells the young, immature ones, if you see him, tell me. That's humility. She's saying, if you've seen him, tell me. I want to see him. And then she describes, I mean, she describes his head, his pure gold, which is his leadership. There's different, I, really, this whole book is worth studying, but the descriptions are so great. Like, his hair, black as a raven. You're like, that's cool. It means that his hair is, he's youthful in his zeal and strength. Because black means he's not, doesn't have gray hair. It means it's young, vibrant. He is like, I love gray hair, by the way. I have some, it's just covered up. My husband has plenty too. So he is like the Lord in his passion, his leadership. He's youthful and vibrant as much as he's ancient of days and wise and holy. It's just fun to read these descriptions because you'll fall in love with him. His cheeks are the bed of spices, meaning he's got so many emotions and they're fragrant and they're rich we need to feed on the emotions of God. He's emotional about us, very emotional. It does something in our hearts. As I, I, like I said, I was a very shut down person. Not even because I had, I had good parents, I have godly parents. It's just our culture. It's always like, be okay, you're okay, you're okay. I'm like, no, I, I'm not okay. I went to a counselor recently for, um, well, it's, it's good to go to counselors, by the way. It's fine. There's no shame in it. But my mother is sick with um, dementia. And so there's a lot of pain going on. And I, I miss my mom. So I was like, okay, this is really painful. I need to go talk to a counselor. And I'm like, I'm not okay just from different things that have happened in the last year and a half. And so the counselor was like, I said, I'm not okay. He goes, so are, how are you with not being okay? I go, oh, I'm great with it. But, <laughs> He's like, that's actually, he's like, good job. Like, that's great. I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm fine. I'm not, I'm not okay, and that's okay. <laughs> like, I don't have anything to prove. I don't have to be okay. That is not the point of Christianity. It's not being people who have it all put together. It's being people who have touched and tasted him and can talk about him and can say, he likes me. He loves me. He's delivered me from this. He's brought me out of this. I'm not a sinner, mostly. I mean, I, we all sin. It's not, but I'm not a sinner. Who, that's not who I am. I'm his bride. That is my identity. That's who I am when we stand. That's what it means to be a Christian. And we ha I'm going to have seasons till he comes that I'm not okay. Like I'm, like, I'm okay in a way, but I'm also, I'm not okay. I'm grieving. There's a, a death in my heart because of my mother right now. 
And I can't just shut that. I have to live in that. And then like life just keeps happening. So she describes who she is. And then that's when they say, after that description, it's like the best sermon ever. It's just the knowledge of Jesus. They go, okay, where's your beloved gone so that we could go? I mean, they kind of miss the point. She's looking for him. She doesn't know where he's gone, but they're so captivated by her message that they're going, excuse me, I want what you have. That's what I was talking about with my friend Carly. I was going, I want what you have. Who have you touched? Because it's not the God I grew up with. I mean, it is, but it's like, they, nobody told me about that God. Like, I didn't grow up with that God. I didn't hear about him until I was like 19. And then I was like, really? There's this kind of affection for me? So that's what it happens. And then the rest of the book, it's, then chapter six is basically the bride, it's called The Bride's Vindication. And it's like he thunders about who she is and how beautiful. And one of the descriptions, which when you meditate, it's just like the rest of the scripture. There's layers. One time I was meditating on it and I read the part lovely as Jerusalem. And it's like, okay, cool. But I'm like, no, you have to know what Jerusalem is in his heart. That is the apple of his eye. He will not look. I'm like, I, would, he, I said, I don't think it's right. Like, you can't say that I'm lovely as Jerusalem. But that's what he says about each one of us. That affection he has for that geographical spot. And he will not relent. He's been like, I've been looking. I'm surprised it's not like Superman. There's not something burned in that. Like, he has had his gaze set. He will not relent. That's how he feels about us. And we... Jerusalem isn't lovely right now, really. It's, I mean, it is in a sense, but he knows what she's supposed to look like. He knows that loveliness that we can't see, and it's the same with us. He calls her lovely as Jerusalem, and then he just describes her. And then this is the best part. She is so confident in his love that no longer is she like I was with my husband, looking away, dodging his gaze. She just gazes right back. And when she's describing him, then he comes back and he says, in verse chapter 6, after his description, he says, turn your gaze away, for you've overwhelmed me. Do you know you could move him that much? It, it, I think it took us to like our wedding or maybe a honeymoon, that I could actually match my husband's gaze because I had to grow in that confidence. I know it's just a dim little picture, but that's what the Lord wants. And the, there's so much more to this book, but it ends with her running in ministry with Jesus. I mean, soaring in ministry, and she's pouring herself out without getting burnt out because she's always receiving Always. The receiving never stops. It's not like we ever get past receiving. Like that is the power. Like I said, the most mature believer is the one who receives love all day long and just says, you like me, you love me. And she runs in this race. And um, it's like my son, David, has, you could say he's audacious or whatever. I just call it faith. The kid it just but always believes faith. So like he has faith. If I tell him something like, I don't think that's there. He's like, no, it is like he knows. <laughs> but we have this thing where when I drive in the garage, if, if my husband's been home with the boys and I had to go do something, he runs out to the van and he goes, do you have something special for me? Every time he knows. And sometimes I don't have a tangible thing, but I give him a hug and I do something, but he knows there's something in your purse. And now Jariah, who's two, comes and goes, special mommy, special. I'm like, how could you not give that kid a lollipop? Like, oh my gosh. But I felt like there was a hard, I had a hard day recently and the Lord goes, why don't you ask me that? Like, think, like Jess, I am that good father. I have affection for you. Just be that audacious. Just be that bold. Because that, we want to have it all put together. A picture I had years ago was I was out here like a little, you know, person, and the Lord's fixing this and fixing this, and then he was going to bring me into his heart. And he was like, that's not how I work. I bring you into my heart, and as close as you will let me, I bring you that close, and that's where I start to heal you. 
and shift things. I'm not a God who fixes you so that you got it all together and then you can run with me. That's not the, like that's with our kid. When David is like struggling, we wrestle him and then we hug him. Like wrestle, not in a bad way, like wrestle for fun. Or we just say, I'm going to hold you. And he'll squirm and squirm and squirm. We're like, no, just trust. I'm just going to hold you until you trust that I'm good. And that's what the Lord is aching that, and I, like, and then too, with my son, sorry to stop my thought, but I don't want to parent my son so that he just does the right thing. So many of us grew up like, you just do what's right. You do the right thing. You say the right thing. I want a kid who chooses and who feels like we, I talk to my son all the time going, you know, I like you even when you make bad choices. He goes, I know, I know. He does know though. I go, you know, I like you when you make good choices. He's like, yep. I'm like, you know, I like you no matter what. But, and I want the Lord to help your heart make good choices. But that's how the Lord is too. He's not saying, just get it together, would you? But those are the voices we hear all the time. If I was a better Christian, if I loved you more, I would do this. It's all a religious spirit, whatever you want to call it. It's lies from the enemy saying, whatever. That's not how the Lord treats us. And he just loves us. And he's like a good, the, he is the best parent ever the best bridegroom ever who wants to motivate us with his love so that we be, can be ones who are so confident. Imagine an army of confident in his love people. We might have different theology. We're all, I mean, until Jesus comes back, good night, we're all going to have a few different things. You know, we're all going to get it sorted out. Like, I, I hate, like, there's just politics sometimes. And I'm like, I just can't wait till he comes back because then we're all going to be like, oh, sorry about that. But we agree on that. And it's just going to be easier. But until then, imagine if the, the theme of your life, yes, we all have callings. I have a calling. I have things I'm called to do. I'm married. But literally, if you boil down the dream of my heart, it is, I just want to be confident in love. Because that changes everything. That changes my day. That changes how I parent. That changes the wife I am. It changes how I walk around here. And I can't do that of myself. It's really about me sitting down. I sit down with my journal sometimes and say, what do you think about me today? And you do it. Write down what he says, because he's going to say a bunch of good stuff. He does. And he sometimes, he, he's told me my weaknesses. But it felt like, you know, that there's a difference. When the enemy speaks, there's condemnation and shame. And you don't feel emboldened. When the Lord told me that I was compliant to a fault as a people pleaser, I felt so emboldened to get free. I was like, oh, I am. What are we going to do about that? Like, help. There was no shame. There was no condemnation. That, but that's the confident in love. And then also just want to highlight a couple of verses in chapter 8. I kind of skipped chapter 7, but you can look at it another time. Um, in chapter 8, let me just... She describes... Well, she says, put one of the famous verses of Song of Solomon is, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Basically, that's just saying, all of my days, let me love with your love, and the arm is ministry. Let me work with your love. Seal it so that in all that I do, it's always your love, not me. I don't want my seal. I want the king's seal. And then also you can flip it, because I've heard both. I have a friend who lives in Israel. She views it the other way, where it's Jesus, all that you do, because he's the king with the seal. He, he wears the seal usually. And so it's like, all that you do, do it on my behalf. And in your ministry and in your love and affection. But one of the verses I want to highlight real quick, and then we can wrap it up, is she says, I was a wall and my breasts were like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who finds peace. The wall speaks of maturity and the towers, you can look it all up. Basic, But the point I want to highlight too is it says, then I became in his eyes as one who finds peace. Like that, and that's like, I'm sure you could, shalom, peace. That's not just like, oh, I feel at peace. That is like that wholeness, that peace. And that, this verse is probably one of my life verses that I pray for my own heart between me and the Lord. I want that rest between him and me where I'm not pushing him away anymore. I'm not striving saying it's too much where I'm actually letting him. 
fluffy message sometimes, but it's not. Just one more little snidbit, tidbit, snidbit, whatever, on even the Gospels. Like, I'll talk on Thursday, but Jesus and the Gospels in, is one of my favorite topics. But imagine, I like to imagine sometimes the Father, even at the Nativity, people are always like, Mary, I'm always like, I like to think of the Father and the angels and what they were doing while Jesus is born. And I mean, I even imagine the angels were like, so can we go sing? Is that okay? Like, could we go tell somebody? Because this is awesome. It's the first time in the Bible that the, there's, there's a choir singing. There, Ezekiel saw the angels, but this is the first time there's a huge army singing. Anyways, so I imagine at the baptism, it's one of my favorite points. Like, um, like I've said, we don't know the depths of the love of God. So imagine Jesus it's time for him to step into ministry. He's getting baptized. We all know the story in John 3. John the Baptist baptizes him. The father speaks and says, this is my beloved son. We just look at it like, oh, yeah, that's great. But imagine for the first time since the garden, there was a human standing on the earth that fully received the father's love and didn't push him away. It's the first time, the first time the father got a shout, that's my son, and that person didn't step back into a shadow in shame or didn't say, no, it's too much. It's the first time, and Jesus just said, uh-huh, here I am. That's what he's looking for, is those ones he can look down, what do you call the balcony of heaven, whatever, and go, that one, she's mine, and we stand up with confidence, and we say, I'm the one that you like, no matter what anybody has labeled me, when no matter what that church has labeled me, or my family has labeled me, or the enemy has labeled me, I'm the one you like, not just love. He likes us and enjoys us like I enjoy my children. He really has that deep affection He's not passive up there. So when you view Jesus in the Gospels, flip it, not flip it, but often get up higher sometimes and think about what the Father's feeling. Like after I had my first baby, I, I lost it. I'm like, Father, you wanted to hold him. The Father wanted to hold that little baby. I'm sure he did in some way, and the Holy Spirit was there. I don't get it all, but I'm like, you want to touch him. Like even while I was pregnant with my first son, I was like, the Lord was like, this is what it's like. Because I was like, no human will ever be closer than my three boys were. Not even my husband. Like, those three boys have been the closest to me that any human will ever be. Unless there's another baby, I don't know, coming. But I felt that. I was like, Lord, there's this baby in there, but it's still not enough. And the Lord goes, that's how I feel until the day I get to be with you. I am perfectly connected with you, Jess. We are one. We are one. There's that divine connection between us and the Godhead right now, but it's not fully realized because I didn't get a hold. My, I wasn't holding David. I mean, it was in me, but it's different. I mean, if you've had a baby, you know, it's different once they come out and you get to hold them and see their face. So I'm just using those to say the level of affection that he has for us surpasses anything we could think or imagine. And this song just gives language to that, gives context and gives a storyline and validates our own stories. Because every time I share this, people identify with different parts of the storyline and they go, oh, that's happened. And it's just encouraging because you can know that's just the way he leads. It's not a foolproof like storyline. I'm not, I mean, the book is foolproof, but you know what I'm trying to say. Like, he's not going to lead it the same for everybody. Um, the worship leader. Is she here? Or my husband. Somebody. Do you want to play keys? Oh, or Krista. Yeah, the harp would be perfect. Well, it's the heart. Like, basically, feels like it. So I'm just going to have them come and play for a little bit. Yes, Krista, too, please. Um, and I'm just going to pray. And then if you want prayer, I, I, you don't have to, but if you want prayer, you can stand up by the cross. You can stand up where you're seated. If you just want, I mean, it's okay to want more. 
there's that thing in us in our culture too. It's like, no, I'm good. We're not good. We always need more. We need to be those children like my son, David. Every day is a new day of surprises to him. Every day is a new day of what do you have for me? Every day is like, can you hold me? Can you hold me? Can you hold me? And we need to be those children that are so quick to, oh, there you are. All of you can all come now. Be those children that are so quick to run into our arms. This is what's going to sustain us. I know even in, like, we have funny stuff happening in the U.S. Barbados has election things and different things. Even if the elections went good, that's not what's going to sustain you. Not, like nothing that happens in the natural is what's going to answer that ache in our hearts. It's only his affection and receiving of his love and saying, I want to receive. Help me receive. It looks different for everybody. Sometimes it just means talking to him and listening and, and receiving of that love. So I'm just going to pray for us. And like I said, if you want prayer, we have different people who can pray for you. And if you don't, that's great. Maybe we'll just sit in a, t a atmosphere of worship too and of quietness and receiving. The Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come with your affection. Jesus, we ask that you would shine the light of your face down on us. That tender, jealous, fiery gaze that you have for each one of us, whether we believe it or not, we say you like us. You adore us. Your gaze is set on us. And you're just asking for us to glance up and learn to trust you. We ask, Father, for the knowledge of your son. Would you let him kiss us with the kisses of his, of his word in the depths of our heart? That we would believe. That we would receive and believe of his love and his confidence. Lord, right now I just take authority over every lie every distraction, everything from the enemy. We just plead the blood of Jesus over this room, over minds and hearts. We submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your love and your light shining down on us. Thank you that we can be once confident in love. Thank you, Lord, for your affection. Thank you, Lord, that you're not weary or discouraged. He's not a discouraged dad. He's not a frustrated husband. He's a delighting husband. He's an encouraging dad. Lord, I ask for these truths to wash over us, that you're different than we think you are. You're different than our dads, even if we had great dads. You can't compare. Your head is like the finest gold. Your leadership is perfect. Tonight, God, I ask, would you fill us with the knowledge of this truth of your love and your affection? I ask, like in Ephesians, that we would know the length and depth and height of your love that passes knowledge. Or that we would be ones rooted and grounded in love. And we would say, come what may. We know who we are. We know we're loved. And it would be this brilliant light shining to the world. Or we want to be burning and shining lamps, not because of our ministries, but because of our confidence in love and of who you are. You're not a man that you would lie. Father, you're not a father that you're not attentive to your children. So right now, God, I ask that you would touch hearts, pierce hearts. I ask for that arrow of your love to hit those deep places where we're scared, where we've hidden in shame, just like in the garden, Lord, where we've stepped back. Let us be ones who receive love like Jesus. So pour out your love into our hearts, I ask tonight, in Jesus' name.